For Wordsworth, spots of time are those moments in our past which are especially energetic. They can be happy, they can be sad, they can be weird. There are those times in our past when we feel most alive. We know this. We've studied Wordsworth. We've in particular looked at those moments in the prelude that he describes in the prelude, uh, the moments where as a child he uh, steals the boat or, or steals eggs from, an, from a nest. Uh, he steals uh, woodcocks from the traps of others. These moments of transgressions where he feels as if the very natural landscape is hounding him um, in the name of justice. Or when he um, and his friend get lost in the Alps and the loss doesn't necessarily lead to despair but in fact leads him while writing the poem to have this ecstatic vision of the power of imagination which allows us never to feel lost. Now De Quincey, deeply informed by Wordsworth, uh, had his own idea of spots of time. The word he uses for Wordsworthian spots of time shows his similarity to Wordsworth but also his difference. That word is involute, involute. Um, a word that somewhat comically Charles Lamb uses to describe the ear um, in his famous essay on ears, chapter upon ears, chapter on ears that we uh, read earlier. So this is De Quincey in one of his later works called um, De Suspiria de Profundis. I'm sorry, Suspiria de Profundis, um, Sighs from the Depths, mm -hmm. which is in some ways a sequel to uh, Confessions of an English Opium Eater. Um, it is a further exploration of dream, of fantasy, of reverie, of opium trip. Um, and in this book, he says that because of many experiences um, of death in a summertime setting, he now associates summer not with life, as one typically would, but instead associates summer with death. Of course, the most potent moment of uh, the association of summer and death would be the moment the day after his sister Elizabeth, nine, died, and he, six, goes into her room uh, without anyone knowing. The window is open. He feels a harsh, hot wind blow through the window, and he looks up into the blue sky, and he imagines a shaft um, running from earth up to heaven. In Suspiria de Profundis, he says um, further of this association the following. Um, the reason that I associate summer with death. Um, it lies in the antagonism between the tropical redundancy of life in summer and the dark sterilities of the grave. The summer we see, the grave we haunt with our thoughts. The glory is around us, the darkness is within us. And the two coming into collision each exalts the other into stronger relief. But in my case, there was an even subtler reason why the summer had this intense power of vivifying the spectacle or the thoughts of death. And we know what that reason is, the death of Elizabeth. In recollecting death and it being associated with summer, or in experiencing summer in the present and it calling forth death, well, this is, in Quincy's mind, an involute. Recollecting it, recollecting that moment when my sister died in the summer, often I've been struck with the important truth that far more of our deepest thoughts and feelings pass to us through perplexed combinations of concrete objects, pass to us as involutes, if I may coin that word, in compound experiences incapable of being disentangled than ever reach us directly and in their own abstract shapes. So what Wordsworth calls association, um, one event tied with another event, meaning that either event can call forth the other um, when we remember it or perceive it, De Quincey gives a much more complicated image, the idea of different different um, aspects of a moment being kind of spiraled together like an involute, um, intricate, involved, maybe even convoluted. In other words, there's much more ambiguity to um, 
a memory of De Quincey than there is to a Wordsworthian memory. Now this idea that powerful memories um, are involutes, I think influences De Quincey's style, which is very involuted. If, again, if you think of an involute as a spiral, usually, usually a form that spirals inward, um, but also a form that's just intricate, uh, complex, manifold. Uh, this is De Quincey's writing style, and we'll look at specific examples of this writing style in Confessions of an English Opium Eater. But I just want to look at one more passage in Suspiria de Profundis, where he ultimately describes to us what his style is like, and we can quickly see how this style connects to the idea of the involute. So here's what he says. He says, my true object um, in my opium confession is not the naked physiological theme. I'm not that interested in just writing about opium as a scientific phenomenon. On the contrary, that is the ugly pole, the murderous spear, the halbert. But those wandering musical variations upon the theme, those parasitical thoughts, feelings, digressions, which climb up with bells and blossoms round about the arid stock, ramble away from it at times with perhaps too rank a luxuriance. But at the same time, by the eternal interest attached to the subjects of these digressions, no matter what were the execution, spread a glory over incidents that for themselves would be less than nothing. So this sense that his language, it's musical, but it's music in such a way that, listen, listen to the imagery, um, the music climbs up the bells um, like a kind of parasite. Um, and the music is a kind of blossom and entwining and circling, spiraling around the subject. That's what his words are. Um, there's sounds that spiral, there are vines that whirl. Um, and this is ultimately what turns De Quincey on. The sound, the music, uh, the lyricism is ultimately more important to him than what he is writing about. Uh, so m powerful memories as involutes, they shape who we are. Powerful language as involute, um, which shapes our thoughts and feelings of who we are.